Behind me is the Northrop Tacit Blue, and this was a technology demonstrator designed to test stealthy technology as well as low probability of intercept radar, and a whole lot of other things which are probably still classified. Whilst this aircraft never went into production, some of its features went into the B-2 Spirit, and again, probably other things that are still classified. There's only one anywhere in the world, and it's here behind me, so let's have a closer look at it. I'm Paul Stewart, and I make videos about planes and a few rockets. If you're into reviews of flights from around the world and detailed tours through interesting aircraft and museums, then please check out my channel and subscribe. And a massive thanks to the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio for allowing me to make this video. I've recorded over 100 gigabytes of footage over the last two days here, and many more videos are coming. And by the way, this is the incredible view from the cafeteria, which is mind-blowing for any ab geek. Called Advanced Projects 1 by Northrop and the Alien School Bus by Engineers, this was a top secret program. In fact, it was a site sensitive program, so engine runs were done inside a hangar, and the first time outside was to check the radar return and high speed taxi runs. Of interest, the Air Force designated it YF 117 Delta, implying that it was a variant of the F 117 Nighthawk and to possibly confuse any spies. The first successful flight was in 1982 in Area 51 and its existence wasn't declassified until 1996. This design proved that something could be stealthy without having the straight lines or facets that we saw on the F-117 Nighthawk. Whilst this is much squarer, it has a very similar smooth and rounded underside to the B-2 Spirit which was introduced one year later in 1997. Similar in theory to the chines that we saw with the SR-71 Blackbird, this also has these horizontal lines leading aft from the nose and they act to improve directional stability with increased angle of attack and generate lift themselves. They also avoid presenting corner reflections or vertical sides to radar waves, therefore reducing the radar cross-section. Now you may have noticed that he doesn't have any pitot-static tubes and this is because they would significantly increase the radar return. The F-117's engineers made their tubes faceted like you can see here, but that's not ideal. So instead, they're hidden and made up of small holes that are flush with the skin, similar to what I show you in my YF-23 video. This system was then incorporated into the B-2. Unlike the SR-71, which would zoom over the adversary at high speed and take photos, this would loiter around and provide live updates while being difficult to detect by enemy radars. The SR-71 was happy to be detected as it would simply fly faster than any incoming missiles. This also tested an LPI, or low probability of interception radar, hence the large flight fuselage to fit in the antenna designed by Hughes. Now remember that radar waves are easy to detect by the enemy themselves, therefore the F-117 didn't actually have one. To avoid being located, they can constantly modify the frequency and other classified techniques so that they may be noticed, but it would be impossible to actually locate them. The information from the battlefield radar would then be transferred up to a data link satellite and then back down to headquarters. The AN APQ181 radar in the B2 is classified, although it's made by the same company, Hughes, who are now called Raytheon, so it's possible to assume that it's quite similar. Let's have a look at the wing, which is a straight out design, maximizing lift, especially at high altitudes, as top speed was not a consideration. Of interest, it has a Clark Y airfoil, which is a rounded upper surface and a flat underside. This is an unusual design for modern aircraft. In fact, it was used by the likes of the Hawker Hurricane from World War II and the Spirit of St. Louis from the 1920s until the 40s. But the flat underside was ideal for the low radar cross section. Otherwise, it's a very smooth design with the exception of some panels stuck on since it was retired. Let's move in underneath the wing and have a look at the landing gear, which is a pretty standard tricycle layer. They recycled it from other fighters with a nose wheel from an F5E and the main gear from an F16. It's interesting seeing all of the technical lines in the wheel well, but let's be honest, it is such a smooth and basic looking aircraft that it does look like a wooden mock-up, but I can assure you that this is a very real aircraft. Let's move around to the very smooth and rounded rear end. We know that the traditional empennage, which is the tail section, considerably increases the radar return, hence why the B-2 doesn't actually have one. 
although that raises other complications as I explained in my B2 guided tour video which I'll link to below. But back to the tacit blue. The next best thing is a V-tail arrangement similar to the YF23 and includes two control surfaces that can work as both the runner and the elevator, so called the rudivator. This will have some radar return, but less than the standard tail end. Now it's powered by two Garrett ATF36 turbofan engines producing 5,440 pounds of thrust each. You won't have noticed any engine intakes at the front and this is because they're on top of the fuselage. Now we know that the turbine blades have a massive radar return, hence why any stealth aircraft has the engine sunk well within the fuselage, and this is no exception. Because most radars will be coming from underneath the aircraft, it makes sense to have the less stealthy big hole on top. There was no splitter in the air intake, so if you start one engine, it would suck all of the air, thus making it difficult to start the second engine. So, you had to start both engines at the same time, which required a lot of electricity, rather than the usual process of starting one and then using the power from that to then start the other one. Looking at the back, and it has a special exhaust, which has been removed from this prototype because again, it's all very secret. The B2 prototype's exhaust was also covered up, but like the B2, the exhaust was released well forward of the tail, and it would move over this platypus tail, where it would be cooled by mixing with atmospheric air that did not pass through the hot core of the engine. Remember that heat-seeking attack systems will identify any hot exhaust, so it needs to be much cooler by the time it leaves the end of the tail. Now this would obviously reduce the thrust performance, but that was not a priority in this aircraft. Check out my YF23 video, which has a similar, well, we assume so, heat dissipating system, which was not removed from the prototype and is visible to look at. Looking back at the starboard side of the V-tail, you noticed that this is all one moving piece, as opposed to having fixed positions with hinged controls. Again, this reduces the amount of panel gaps, which all increase radar return. It's interesting compare it with this YF-12 next to it, which was the interceptor version of the SR-71, as it had many panel gaps, although these triangles were made of radar absorbing material as well. It's also a much older prototype, so I can understand why it may not be in as good condition. The aircraft is covered in radar absorbent material or RAM, and its curved surfaces low observable performance validated, and it was used on the B-2 and TSSAM, which stands for the Tri-Surface Standoff Missile. There was also an interesting story from the development process, where during radar return testing of a scale model, they were horrified to discover that it was far more visible than what their calculations had projected. It turns out that an owl had actually landed on it, and it was lighting up the radar. During flight testing, any minor change in the aircraft's radar signature resulted in them crawling all over every centimetre of it to identify the problem, such as a panel gap or a piece of RAM that had been displaced. Like the B-2, maintaining this type of aircraft is hugely complex, as any Air Force who has purchased the F-35 has discovered as well. Now the interior is closed, although the museum have posted up these photos. It was designed for one pilot and all the intelligence systems were automated, and I'm sure it would have eventually been modified for remote control if it had gone into production. It was extremely unstable in flight, which is no surprise by looking at it, hence it had a quite a redundant fly-by-wire system that could constantly make very small adjustments. Its radar was apparently nearly good enough to identify what type of vehicles it was flying over, and that was impressive for the 1980s. Although they could have just looked for a big plume of smoke in the open bonnet and known it was a Chevy. Obviously Fords never do that, and I'm not biased at all. It had no defensive or offensive equipment other than the stealthiness, therefore it would have been a sitting duck if an enemy fighter did happen to stumble across it. The program ended in 1985, although as I said earlier, it remained classified until 1996, around when the B-2 was revealed. It flew 135 times and was generally considered a success. What's interesting is that I bet there's a lot more to the story and we may not get a full picture until another decade or two when other related aircraft are declassified themselves. I hope you enjoyed my video and please check out my other videos around aircraft I mentioned in this one, including the B-2 Spirit, YF-23, YF-12 and the F-117. Thanks for watching.